Hello and welcome to this conversation with our partners at uh, Denver University and International Security uh, Program at New America. I'm Candace Rondeau. I'm the director of the Future Frontlines Program at New America. And also I am leading a initiative called Planetary Politics, which is part of this conversation. Um, where we are today is not where we are seven, were, were seven months ago. Uh, the planet was looking a, a little bit different. The world was looking a little bit different. Um, a lot has happened uh, since the start of this year. And most important, of course, uh, among other things, is the war in Ukraine. And what we know is that that war has challenged our institutions, challenged our sense of peace, of stability, um, and most importantly for many countries around the world that rely on Ukraine and Russia uh, to some extent for, for food supplies, for agricultural supplies in particular, it has been an incredibly disruptive time in their lives and in, in the economy and the social structure uh, of their countries. In fact, um, if you believe the World Food Programs figures, some 36 countries now are deep in, uh, in hoc when it comes to food security. Um, almost 60% of their, those 36 countries has a population living below the poverty line and they are unable to afford food in large part because the war in Ukraine has decimated the uh, country's ability to produce and export uh, important goods like wheat, uh, sunflower oil, uh, and so forth. And that food crisis is a reminder of how much um, we are challenged today by our interconnectedness, by our planetary existential problem of um, this shared space uh, in our warming planet uh, and our planet that is also st stressed by um, disease and conflict. Um, all of this um, tells us that we have a big problem uh, and um, that when something happens in one part of the world, it often affects another part of the world. Most Americans uh, and um, Europeans fully understand this now um, because every day uh, when they go to the store, um, they find that uh, you know, their price of bread and milk and eggs uh, is 10% you know, higher in some cases, 12% higher uh, than it was just a few months ago. When they go to the gas pump, uh, they experience shock, of course. And we know that winter is coming in Europe in particular, uh, that this challenge that Ukraine has presented the world um, exposes the many, many flaws with a mismatch between our institutions and the problems that we face today. And that's sort of what planetary politics is all about, a new initiative that we're rolling out here uh, with this first kickoff event and conversation with our colleague Deborah Avant and her colleagues uh, on the panel. First, let me also introduce Deborah. Um, Deborah Avant uh, really often doesn't need much introduction. introduction. She's been around for a long time and she's been very influential in the realm of um, how we think about um, civilian and military relations. Uh, she's written extensively on that subject um, and has led many conversations on the future of international security uh, at Denver University, where she is the Siu Chao Kang Chair for International Security and Diplomacy uh, at the School for International Studies. Um, she has today with her an, an amazing panel uh, of experts from all over the world, uh, and I will let her introduce them now. Thanks so much, Candice. Um, and I'm, I'm super happy to be here um, as part of sort of my new uh, affiliation with New America on the Planetary Politics um, Project. Um, and let me just start by, by noting the obvious um, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has captured the world's attention. Uh, few expected Putin to launch such an overt invasion and even fewer expected Ukraine to respond with such resolve. Um, when offered an airlift to safety at the beginning of the conflict, uh, pres Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky responded, the fight is here. I need anti-tank ammo, not a ride. Um, transnational society responded with an outpouring of support. Companies pulled operations out of Russia. Protesters marched in solidarity. Yellow and blue flags flew everywhere. And even some of my academic friends flew to Poland to give rides to Ukrainian refugees. Um, 
Western governments followed suit uh, with far reaching economic sanctions and have committed 1.55 billion in military aid. In the last few weeks, that aid has looked well spent as Ukrainian counteroffensive has seized back territory from Russia in the east. Nonetheless, as Candace mentioned, the war has caused massive destruction and loss of life in Ukraine. It's also generated food and energy crises. Um, it's deepened supply chain disruptions in the global economy, and it's generated questions about the future of global order and global security. And so, um, I'm really happy to discuss these questions to have such a um, wealth of expertise on this panel. So first we'll have uh, Volodymyr uh, Dubovic, who is an associate professor at the Department of International Relations and director of the Center for International Studies at Odessa Mechnikov National University in Ukraine. He is co-author of Ukraine and European Security and has published numerous articles on US-Ukraine relations, regional and international security, and Ukraine's foreign policy. Next, we have Azada Moavani. She's an academic, write, uh, an academic and a writer who specializes in gender and conflict. She's an associate professor at NYU and an advisor to the International Crisis Group. Her latest book is Guest House for Young Widows Among the Women of ISIS. And she recently wrote about Ukrainian women's experiences of wartime displacement for the London Review of Books. Luis Rodriguez is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. He studies how the global South has been able to contest and shape norms that govern the use of force and has written about the reaction among Latin American countries um, to the war in Ukraine. And last but not least is Alexander Cooley, the Claire Tao Professor of Political Science and Vice Provost at Barnard College, Columbia University. His research focuses on the politics of sovereignty, governance, and international order, with a focus on post-Soviet states. His books include Great Games, Local Rules, The New Great Power Contest in Central Asia, and most recently, Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of the American Global Order, co-authored with Dan Nexon. So let me start uh, in the order I introduced uh, with Volodymyr. Um, can you briefly describe the impact of the war on Ukrainian politics and society, as well as its relations with others, as you see it from inside Ukraine? Sure, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for having me in this event uh, to the New America and also to the colleagues, uh, because of course, for us Ukrainian scholars these days, it's an uh, invaluable experience every time we speak to the audience uh, to share what we go through, what we live through. And uh, also uh, we use this uh, as an opportunity to thank everyone for support, because of course it's an uh, outpouring of enormous uh, scale of support for Ukraine in recent months, and we really appreciate this. And frankly, it would be much more difficult for us to withstand uh, uh, the whole uh, invasion without that support. Uh, be it financial assistance, uh, weapons supply, or even the moral support uh, coming from uh, outside of Ukraine. So right now I'm here in the Western Ukraine, uh, being an internally displaced person, my hometown of Odessa hasn't been uh, subjected to such an intensive shelling as say, uh, Mariupol or Kharkiv or Mykolaiv or some other places in Ukraine, but still it wasn't in, 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 a, in a dangerous kind of situation there early on in the war. So I moved out and uh, that's where I am. I'm doing my classes online now from, from a distance and my uh, colleagues and my students, uh, they're all sh scattered around the place. Uh, I mean, Ukraine, outside of Ukraine. So that's a reality of our life. So nothing is normal anymore for millions and millions of us, as you know. In terms of our security situation, uh, uh, of course, it's volatile still. The aggression is very much ongoing. Even though we have been seeing some signs of uh, Russia been meeting its, uh, what the scholars, military scholars say, call it a culminating moment. And actually I've been past that culminating moment. They couldn't really advance anymore in anywhere in Ukraine, frankly, but they still possess a lot of firepower and uh, missiles and, uh, and financial resources as well for this war to go on. In Ukraine, uh, we have seen uh, an enormous uh, uh, scale of uh, resilience uh, by the people here in, in the country. And I'm saying it proudly as a Ukrainian myself, I was surprised to a certain extent myself with how much of that resilience we actually saw. And we see it uh, bottom up or 
you know, other way around. Uh, you see it in, a, in the president whom you mentioned, uh, decided to stay in Kiev in dark hours when the Russian troops were getting close. And you see it also in the, everyone else. You see it in university professors. You see it in, uh, uh, you know, firefighters. You see it in uh, emergency workers, uh, definitely in the military, but everyone, everyone. Basically, I'm kind of joking, but half joking, uh, saying that the Ukrainian government is probably working better now in the recent seven months than it used to be before February 24th. Uh, so if everyone expected Ukraine to unravel somehow, including Ukrainian governance, uh, it didn't happen. I mean, Ukraine has proved quickly that we are not a failed state, something to the contrary of it, uh, which got its act together in many ways, you know, in terms of a political consolidation and so on. So this resilience is still around. I mean, it's a dark uh, time for us. It's a difficult war. We all enduring some, some struggles and some suffering. And, and every day I'm seeing some photos of people who are dying in the war. And some I already know quite a lo lot of people, my friends and colleagues who lost someone uh, near to them, close to them in this war. So don't get me wrong. I mean, we don't have any euphoria here in Ukraine or any kind of unlimited uh, boundless optimism. Uh, but we understand, though, uh, that being said, that uh, uh, Russia has failed in its uh, attempt to subjugate Ukraine, that Ukraine will be there to stay as a country, as a sovereign country. Uh, what borders we will have, uh, that's uh, something to discuss further uh, in, in the course of our conversation today. But uh, uh, hopefully, we'll be actually returning many of those uh, lands lost since February 24th. Uh, we are at the inflection point here, I think. Uh, after the Kharkiv uh, offensive, uh, we have proved that not only we can defend our lands heroically, but we can also, also go on offensive. And actually, of kind of offensives that really unravel the entire Russian uh, strategy for the region uh, and uh, you know, put their war effort in even more trouble, even though it was in trouble already before that. Uh, proving to everyone outside of Ukraine that Ukraine is not hopeless, that assistance to Ukraine should be seen as something done in vain, that Russia would prevail anyway, that Ukraine would be able to liberate land. So the importance of Kharkiv offensive was extremely, extremely high, you know, I would say. Uh, even though we slowed down in that direction, but uh, still, as we speak right now, there are talks about Ukrainian troops entering Liman. There are talks about Ukrainian troops penetrating Russian defenses around uh, Severodonetsk, or uh, I think it was Lysychansk actually, but you know, getting close on those points uh, that were uh, taken by Russia with a lot of effort, and then Russia and then Ukrainians basically have done it within like a week, week plus. Uh, uh, you know, and we are also close to Donetsk and in Kherson. Just the other day, there was a key village just north of Kherson, which was liberated by Ukrainian troops. It's not going easy or quick there, obviously, but uh, that's not the point. The point is that Russia is uh, really trembling now these days about Crimea. You know, think about this turnaround of events. You know, in the late February, you, you, you had Putin thinking that he would have Ukraine in the back within days. And now they're worrying about Crimea. You know, they're not capable sometimes of defending their own towns that are involved in the war effort, like they were to others, you know. And uh, uh, I think it's even the uh, US administration has uh, provided their opinion that they are legitimate targets for Ukrainian military since uh, there are the missiles being based that are they're launching against the Ukrainian targets. So we have right to, to launch them back. So uh, uh, right now, Russia is probably trying to up their game in a way and find some solution or sidetrack or something. And uh, that's why they're looking for this magic stick, a magic wonder or something like that. Uh, wonder, wonder, wonder stick, uh, uh, wonder wand, right? <laughs> I was looking for the right word. Uh, and they are probably coming to this idea that uh, they need this referendum in occupied lands. Uh, and then the people there freely, obviously, quotation marks, would say they want to be part of Russia and that would change situation on the ground, but uh, it might not, it will probably will not. I mean, uh, everyone has to see through it. Uh, this lands are Ukrainian, no one's else, you know, and Ukraine will not stop. Ukraine will wage war if they use nukes. I mean, uh, we will still wage the war and try to liberate land. So uh, US dimension is extremely important as well. Uh, actually, I would like to invite everyone who's interested in 10 days from now, there'll be a conference by Ponders Eurasia. I'll be speaking about US-Ukraine relations, which is my field. And I would like to conclude uh, saying that the resolve of international pro-Ukraine coalition is extremely important, not just Ukraine's resilience. So those two taken together are the prerequisites for the Ukraine to be successful and Russia to be defeated in some way. And that's where I'll stay, uh, stop with my uh, introductory remarks. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, that's, uh, it, it's interesting to hear, you know, we hear so much in the news and it's, it's sort of interesting to hear your perspective really reinforcing a lot of the narratives that we've heard. Um, so I wanna go next to um, Asada. Um, you have written, um, you know, about um, not only Ukrainian women, but, you know, kind of the gendered implications of the conflict in Ukraine. And so I just wondered if you would talk about what you've seen um, in, in terms of the, you know, sort of looking at Ukrainian politics and society through this, this gendered lens and sort of the implications of the war for that. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, um, Deborah, and such a pleasure to be uh, with my colleagues on this panel. Um, uh, I'll speak quickly about um, the the sort of gender refracted experiences um, of, of Ukrainians in this war. Um, this is something that uh, at Crisis Group uh, we were certainly looking at um, from very early on. You know, from the, the sort of highly gendered rhetoric of Russia as it as it sort of launched its invasion um, and on the Ukrainian side, the sort of mobilization uh, across Ukrainian society, um, but you know, very visibly women to the Ukrainian army um, invoking gender uh, as part of um, national spirit of resistance or as part of the rationale for this unjust war. Um, but uh, to look specifically at how it's impacted people, um, I'll give you a, a quick overview of the research that we've done in the findings. I mean, I spent, um, uh, about two weeks in Poland uh, along the along the border with Ukraine and in major cities and smaller cities uh, in Poland where Ukrainian women and children uh, were transiting through or staying. And we've also done uh, a great deal of research inside Ukraine itself, looking at the internally displaced population. And to give you a sense of the numbers, um, you know, Ukraine's population pre-invasion at 41 million, 7 million people have fled. Um, areas of active combat um, and are internally displaced. Uh, 7.3 million have left the country and 90% of those are women and children uh, because of uh, Ukraine's policy of conscription for men of, of fighting age with, with some exceptions. Um, so, uh, you know, as with, as with all conflict, um, the situation has created um, really acute and stark vulnerabilities um, uh, for, for people of all genders. Um, I'll speak quickly first about those inside the country who are internally displaced. Um, our findings are that there's a particular sort of subgroup uh, who are most vulnerable within internal displacement. Many people are able to stay among this, um, you know, seven, seven million plus who are internally displaced are able to stay with families or who found accommodation. Um, but there's a really vulnerable group who are staying in collective shelters. That's around 3% of people who are displaced internally. They're living in churches or rehabilitated schools and dormitories. Um, my colleagues at Crisis Group visited uh, one former university dorm where 16 people were sharing one kitchen. Um, so this kind of shortage of accommodation um, and these kind of cramped living conditions have really escalated the risks of gender-based violence. Um, women and children, women and girls who are looking for shelter are, are exposed to people who are offering them accommodation in, in exchange for, for sex and economic uh, labor. Um, the hotlines that were inside the country set up by by different charities and, and NGOs received many calls about this, you know, inside the country. Um, the scale of the need of, of supporting the internally displaced sort of shifted this uh, as a priority simply because of the overwhelming nature um, of other needs. Um, and as well, um, you know, the civil service is, is quite overwhelmed. Many people, many civil servants have left. So essentially the challenge of bringing in aid organizations, scaling up and, and being able to attend to like the specific gender vulnerabilities of those who are internally displaced uh, is really, um, I think it's going to, it's a challenge now and it will be an ongoing challenge. Um, displaced men internally who are not obliged to serve in the army um, have a very hard time. Um, the sense is that they should be fighting, that they should be at the front. And even if they have a valid exemption um, for medical conditions or because if they have three or more children, uh, they struggle to find housing. Um, many are reluctant to register as IDPs out of fear of, of discrimination. Um, the LGBTQ community uh, internally displaced and externally, and I'll turn very quickly afterwards to those who are externally displaced, also faces difficulties um, 
their level of acceptance in society was fragile even before the invasion and now staying in communal shelters and and sort of disjointed accommodation has made it very tough. Um, you know, we've heard accounts of trans women being beaten in shelters. Um, it's, it's a difficult situation um, for them and for the Roma, who often don't have the papers to be able to register as displaced and avail themselves of the resources that the internally displaced might be able to access. Um, they tend to be streamed to Zakarpatia, if um, I'm saying that correctly. Um, correct me, hopefully. Um, so that's so that's a challenge too. Um, but alongside that, you know, I think we have seen an incredible scale of mobilization of women as volunteer forces. Um, the dominant, you know, 70% of volunteers uh, internally are women. So there's like a tremendous um, mobilization of women, not only to join the army, but to be part of this volunteer corps. Um, those leaving, um, which are the other 7 million, um, you know, face pretty acute dangers. Um, many of those who are leaving when I was working along the border um, in March, April, um, were coming from places that were active conflict zones. So they left highly traumatized. Uh, they were, you know, very often exhausted from long journeys. Um, and the risks that they face along the way, uh, kidnapping, human trafficking, there were many young girls who are traveling on their own, or young girls who were with mothers who were sort of dazed with concern for husbands, brothers, sons who were there fighting, um, you know, sort of sort of psychologically really uh, broken, um, very, those young women are very vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and the scale of trafficking and exploitation online is very hard to assess, but very real. Um, so I'll just point that out as something that um, I think the, the frontline response in Poland, the feminist organizations and the trafficking organizations are, are really focused on online trafficking of young women, many cases we've seen i mean i trolled myself uh, alongside some you know on these groups tinder facebook you know groups where refugees are sort of meant to be able to find hosts hosts in different places um those are places where where people are preyed upon um so to to wrap up um labor exploitation i think is the next wave of concern after um initial returns um, many are going back um, now uh, because uh, the elderly, the Roma, those who simply find it too difficult to settle, whether in Poland or elsewhere. Um, and then finally, lastly, um, the challenge of reproductive and health rights, uh, especially in Poland, where the majority of displaced Ukrainian women are staying. Uh, abortion is, is highly restricted. Even access to contraception uh, is very hard. Um, so for cases of those who've suffered war rape, gender-based violence, um, it, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a hostile environment um, to have any kind of um, such reproductive and sexual health needs. So uh, I focused um, on the most immediate concerns and risks, um, and I realized that um, you know, those are the most immediate dangers, but I think we're still at a point where those are the most pressing. So I wanted to give you a kind of panorama of what those inside are facing um, in terms of particular gender vulnerabilities and those outside. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about, you know, other issues um, later in our discussion. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. I have so many questions for you afterwards. Um, but let me turn first uh, uh, to our other panelists. Um, Louis, um, you have written about the different reactions of Latin American countries to um, the war, the Russian invasion. And I just wonder if you share some of your thoughts about that. Perfect. Uh, let me start by thanking New America for organizing this panel and inviting me to speak about the Latin American reactions to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And as the war develops, I think it is necessary to understand how and why global South governments in general approach the Russian actions in Ukraine the way they do. And this is especially the case if we want to win more support for Ukraine from the global South. So I really welcome New America's attention to the various positions of countries in different latitudes. With that said, let me give you a brief overview of how Latin American governments have reacted thus far. And all the countries in the region agree on one thing. They do not want to impose sanctions on Russia, that this is where the consensus breaks. The region has responded to the Russian invasion of Ukraine following two main approaches. The first one is that most Latin American states have supported Ukraine using arguments that ask to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and self-determination and these countries have described the Russian actions as an illegal use of force and as a crime of aggression. But we also have a second group, Bolivia, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, 
see the Russian actions as a legitimate response to the expansions of NATO. The strategic considerations and also authoritarian affinities inform this position. These are countries that the West has sanctioned due to their authoritarian practices, and Russia is one of these main allies. Now, I think that it would be easy to conclude that this minority of Latin American countries might have a pro-Russian stance if we only focus on this consideration. But I think that this country's posture is more accurately described as anti-Western more than a posture accepting the Russian use of force against a weaker neighbor. And these are countries also that highlight moments when Western countries have abused international law with minor consequences, for example, during the IR war in 2003. And they also disapprove of the bias application and enforcement of different rules against non-Western states. They also point out to the selective attention to problems in some developing countries. And finally, then again, when they respond to why they are supporting Russia or why they are not doing more against Russia, they point out to the expansion of Western projects such as NATO. Now, there is a third group of countries that falls in between these two responses. Uh, and those are Brazil and Mexico, where we have the Brazilian and the Mexican diplomats condemning Russia's use of military force against Ukraine, going to different firms like the UN or the OAS, the Organization of American States, criticizing the different actions. At the same time, though, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, and the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, better known as AMLO, have said that they are skeptical of Western actions against the Putin administration. Um, so now I'm going to use the last two minutes that I have to give you a little bit of the latest development from this group, especially uh, coming from uh, Mexico. On September 16, during the celebrations of Mexican Independence Day, Andres Manuel López Obrador proposed a plan to address the war. And he asked to create a mediating body with three main actors, the Pope, uh, Antonio Guterres from the UN, uh, Narendra Modi, the president of India. And what AMLO wants is these three people to mediate between Ukraine and Russia. And he also wants uh, or proposes to seek a five-year global truce of all conflicts. And this is a plan that AMLO proposed without consulting the different actors that would be included. And it's also a plan that has been criticized, especially in Mexico, as a plot to appease domestic criticisms against his potential support uh, for Putin. And externally, it has been criticized as a project that would solidify Russian gains in the conflict, especially if we do get uh, a five-year truce that would only um, free the different um, military gains or military advancements that Russia has made in Ukraine. So finally, I think that just to conclude and wrap up, I think that those divisions that we see in Latin America, these different groups and tensions, are something that we can also see in other regions in the global south, where we have countries that have diplomatic traditions that are very deeply embedded in the rule-based order, following international law and international organizations to face these problems. But at the same time, these are countries that might not want to impose sanctions. And I think that it's necessary to understand the different preferences informing why these countries seem to have this contradictory position. And in the next round of questions, we can talk a little bit more about the positions of these countries when it comes to imposing sanctions on Russia. Great, thanks, super, super interesting. Um, so let me turn now to Alex. Um, and first of all, thank him for suggesting that we do something like this. Um, way back when we were at I ISA last year, this is how these you know sideline conversations turn into um, um, so, sort of bigger and more important um, conversations. But but Alex, you've um, you've voiced skepticism um, about the likelihood that the war would restore the liberal order. Um, yeah. And uh, I wonder if you could talk um, about what you see to be its more likely effects on global order and global security. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, uh, Debbie. And it's just a pleasure to share um, the virtual stage with such thoughtful panelists. Um, I'll say, I think maybe we have to revisit some of the reasons behind the coalescing of the West that we saw, which was indeed remarkable, right? When you think about coordinated central bank sanctions, right, the ECB, and the US, when you think about NATO actually expanding to include Sweden and Finland, you think about the cancellation of Nord Stream, the imposition of individual sanctions of oligarchs, the affirmations of support of Ukraine, um, bilateral 
um, defense aid um, by so many individual NATO members and so on without. So again, the coalescing of the West is truly remarkable. And I think the way Dan and I have written about it, Dan Nexon in our piece initially was this is sort of, you know, the you know, proof that the kind of liberal ordering cartel, when it acts in unison, right, truly still is a force um, in global politics, right, despite books like ours to the contrary. But I think we have to dig a little bit behind this. Um, sort of two, you know, important reasons I was sort of flag, right? One is the speed and the scale of the Russian invasion. Um, I think jolted everyone to go to their maximal level of what they were willing to do very quickly, right? This wasn't sort of a sequence playing out, oh, now um, Donetsk has been recognized. And then, you know, fast forward three months later, now that there's offensive, everything happened at once. It was the nightmare scenario. And because of the lack of coordination amongst the West over things like Afghanistan and the sub deal, things were quite scripted to happen quickly on cue if certain thresholds were met, yeah? The second uh, thing was Russia's actions in the West um, were so highly uh, 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 abhorrent, right? That there was this broad stigmatization of Russia. And you saw that with the withdrawal of the private sector from Russia, right? I think this is one of the unanticipated things that happened. Companies, over a thousand of them now, pulling out and changing their minds within 48 hours. Board calls in the middle of the night, Companies like BP that's endured every kind of political risk in Russia saying, no, we're out. We will strand assets and investments. It's just not worth the candle to be associated with this type of action. So I think when we extend beyond um, the West, um, yes, there is uh, a concern at the violence and stability. There is, is even condemnation of Russia, right? But we don't have the stigmatization of Russia for its actions to the same degree. Um, I would argue not even in the post-Soviet space. We have deep concern in the post-Soviet space. We have um, certainly uh, uh, some calls um, for uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, but there's also real concern that Russia might lash out in this sort of neo-imperial uh, moment and target places like Kazakhstan uh, or resume hostilities with Georgia. Uh, as Luis said, What's really unpopular in the post-Soviet space are also the sanctions, right? A lot of the countries are caught in this kind of neutrality status. On the one hand, they are concerned, they're scared even of Russian intentions, the instability in the region. But on the other hand, they see sanctions as comprehensive and is not giving them room to breathe, right? Take a government like Georgia that has also been invaded by Russia, um, uh, and the government there views its wine industry, 50% of its exports go to Russia, a good proportion of its tourists come from Russia. Uh, uh, and quite frankly, some Georgian officials say, where were these sanctions when we were invaded? Why do you want us to sacrifice to the degree that you're saying and you didn't come to our system? So a little bit of that going on too. Finally, I think there's deep concern in the post-Soviet space about the sort of security vacuum in the region. We've seen recently renewed hostilities as Azerbaijan attacked Armenia proper, not just Nagorno-Karabakh. And we've seen um, uh, actual open all-out conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Now, whether there's a causal link there between Russia's war losses um, and decisions to do this, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't make that claim, but I think there's a broad perception that the region in terms of security dynamics is changing. So where does that leave us? I think part of what we're seeing is not some run to get out of the dollar, right? Or, you know, create parallel uh, kinds of anti-hegemonic payment systems. Uh, maybe those will happen. But I do think this is accelerating trends towards the non-West, right? When we see where are the main centers of sanctions evasion, they're in the UAE, right? Um, Turkey was engaging in some of this, and now they've announced uh, under pressure from the treasury that it won't accept Russian mirror cards. But there are brokering opportunities here. I think many countries, China, India, the ones that abstain, which amount to half the world's population, um, would rather not pick sides, right? For a variety of reasons, whether it's, um, you know, the kind of trope of sort of, you know, Western imperialism, Russia sort of feeding that, um, whether it's perceived hypocrisy of the West, right? You were so concerned, why did you go into Iraq, 
right? Why do you want us to be so concerned about this now? Um, or whether it's just geopolitical hedging, I would say this is India's stance, right? That they don't want to pick sides um, because they view themselves as a great power, emerging power, able um, to engage with all sides. So I think in terms of the global South, um, you know, I, you know one, one final footnote here, perhaps um, what's changed in the last week with both Modi and Xi's critical comments at the SEO is that there's a perception that Ukraine actually uh, might be have greater successes on the battlefield that they considered before, right? And so they're starting to criticize Putin in a way that they didn't. But I think in terms of ordering, um, the name of the game for a lot of these powers is hedging. Not happy about what's happening. Um, certainly a lot of them, uh, uh, um, you know, showing you know, sympathy for the plight of Ukraine, um, but also putting this in a broader global context that the West is quite selective in who it condemns and who it supports. Thanks. That's, that's super interesting. Um, I will, before I, I, I launch another round, um, let me remind people in the audience um, that you can um, you can ask questions. Um, we will we will answer them. Um, and uh, I am told that we are using Slido to submit questions and it's in the box located to the right of the video. Um, and so um, so so look to the box um, and submit your questions. But I'm struck um, as I'm listening to all of you, um, actually about, uh, I think something that you said, Alex kind of lined it up for me, um, when you talked about the liberal order cartel, and it seems like that language is actually telling us something um, about the liberal order and how it's operated that's not so liberal, um, and that maybe has influenced um, some of people's responses. Um, and so maybe um, I'll ask each of you to kind of react um, to, to this, this idea of, um, of the response to Ukraine as being kind of part and parcel of, um, you know, the, the, the impulse of Ukraine um, um, toward the West um, and the degree to which, you know, this embrace, um, you know, um, how tight should it be? Um, certainly, uh, Volodymyr talked about it as critical um, to resilience, um, and yet it also, you know, sort of has has his, his dark side as well. Um, and so, I will I will let each of you kind of respond to this issue of the liberal order cartel. And I mean, when I was thinking about Azada, I mean, I was really taken actually by the London Review of Books. Um, uh, piece that you did about, you know, about issues of reproductive rights and kind of the di distinctions between, you know, rights in Ukraine, um, rights of sort of the internal internally displaced people, but then of people that are going to um, countries that have very different kinds of um, orientations toward those sorts of things. Um, so anyway, let me turn first to uh, Volodymyr, like how, how tight do you want this embrace to be? Well, I want to be embraced uh, by the liberal order. Yes. So uh, well, first of all, myself, uh, personally, I'm a very liberal person, but it doesn't mean that everyone in Ukraine is. I mean, obviously, we have all sorts of ideologies here. But uh, in terms of choosing uh, uh, where we want to be, I mean, the Ukrainian nation is saying uh, out loud uh, that we want to be with the West. We want to be with this uh, family of European nations and definitely not within this uh, some kind of a post-Russia, post-Soviet, post-Eurasian or something uh, order. So uh, Ukrainians are now paying dearly with their lives. And if you remember the, the, the uh, Revolution of Dignity, for instance, the Euromaidan, also, you know, Ukrainians went to the streets to protest, you know, the, the decision by former President Yanukovych not to sign a cessation agreement. So that was quite telling to a lot of people and changed uh, attitudes here in this country, but also attitudes towards Ukraine and other countries. So. And right now, I mean, uh, uh, well, I don't buy, first of all, the whole theory that Russia is peddling for a long time now that uh, it was the West to blame for what is going on because the West was dragging Ukraine into EU and NATO. And how, how, how was it dragging when we were kept on a doorstep without any immediate or even longer term perspective of joining either of those two? And uh, also, I mean, uh, of course, uh, Zelensky was saying even prior to February 24th that, uh, well, if you want us to make a formal statement that we're not planning to go into NATO now, uh, we can do that. Uh, that didn't stop Russia. And now we're finding out that uh, one of the, uh, you know, right-hand uh, men of Putin, uh, Kozak, uh, also came up uh, with some plan that Ukraine would denounce uh, this idea of NATO membership uh, early in the war. 
And then Putin said, it doesn't matter really, you know, we're going to go on uh, and proceed with this invasion. So, so it wasn't about NATO, it wasn't about the EU, it was about Ukraine primarily. And, uh, and of course, uh, Putin, you know, in this year being 100 years of, since the establishment of Soviet Union and uh, Putin uh, approaching uh, quickly enough uh, 70 years jubilee of his own life, you know. So apparently just to bring Crimea into Russia eight years ago wasn't enough. And he just came up with this idea. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, embrace of the West, uh, the tighter it is, the better for me. And frankly, right now, it's a lifeline for us. I mean, because, of course, we should understand it's not just about the war. It's about the ruins uh, in economy. I mean, the economy is ruined, uh, frankly, you know, and uh, whatever recovery effort there will be ahead of us uh, is going to be long and going to be painful and going to be taking not just years, maybe decades. And uh, we will be depending on the Western support here. And we understand that. And also, of course, from the humanitarian assistance and as I spoke about it, uh, you know, that uh, there are IDPs, people like myself, there are refugees. Refugees sometimes even in a better situation because if it's, at least they're getting some support uh, from the governments uh, hosting them. But uh, IDPs here, a lot of people here, they just rely exclusively uh, fully on their own savings. And uh, after seven months of war, those savings, uh, you know, tend to run out. So that's problematic, and of course, uh, we want to be part of, uh, of of the Western society or community of nations. And uh, whatever happened, of course, it only uh, reinforced this resolution, this resolve among Ukrainians that we should get away from Moscow. There was a famous Ukrainian writer, political poet, and political uh, 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 you know kind of guy, a hundred years ago, Mikhail Khvilovy, and he came up with this. Uh, a slogan, uh, head with Moscow, so get away, get away from Moscow, and culturally, civilizationally, politically, now security-wise, militarily, it still remains very relevant to Ukraine, and there is no other way for us to go there, uh, but to join this community. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Azana, um, you know, uh, please respond kind of how you how you see fit. Um, but I, I think that, that there's a lot of difficulties um, actually in in the sort of interaction between um, the sort of the Western norms and, and the people that are fleeing. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll start with what what you touched upon before, which is um, which is Poland. Poland is a main destination country for um, Ukrainian women and children who, who've left their homes uh, and the implications of Poland. Um, you know, before this conflict, the, the realities of Poland and Hungary sort of sliding into non-democratic realities um, out of sync with the rest of the EU and the ethos of the EU seemed, um, seemed regrettable, but um, mainly a problem that would be sort of endured within their own borders. Um, I think now we see Poland's um, kind of wholesale uh, sort of shutting down of sexual and reproductive, key sexual and reproductive rights for women uh, as something that has far wider implications. Um, and, and I've really been struck by um, the inertia of the women, peace and security community in the EU um, and, and wider around, around dealing with this. Um, it's complicated. Poland is a sovereign state. It has sovereign laws around, um, around outlawing abortion. Uh, but the realities are that, you know, in practice, even though it has some exceptions uh, for, for abortion in cases uh, of rape, um, practically, you know, to get a prosecutor to sign off and to go through the, the rigmarole of, of getting that legally approved is almost impossible. Um, so the implications for you know a very large number um, of Ukrainian women who are enduring life displaced in in Poland, um, confronting trafficking, conduct, you know confronting sur confronting survival sex, you know all of the circumstances that wartime displacement inflicts on women. At the same time, kind of coming up against. Um, you know, a regime of illiberal um, kind of regulations around basic reproductive rights um, and the, the sort of difficulties, um, I think, that um, the EU and the sort of wider Western liberal feminism cartel, um, you know, their sort of inability to deal with this. I mean, largely it's Polish feminist groups and European feminist groups dealing with this in a very practical way, sort of, uh, giving women counseling um, on the phone uh, in Ukrainian, getting abortion medication or pills sent from, you know, Holland or whatever. But it's hard, I mean, if you're staying in a, in a refugee center, um, you know, uh, 
you don't have an address, uh, it's very hard. Um, so this is certainly a kind of clash of um, sort of expected norms and rights within within the EU space that we're seeing um, kind of utterly neglected in this situation. And sort of the, the right wing, I mean, I'll be direct about it, ascendancy in Poland. Um, I met a lot of Ukrainian women who were having to uh, inside Poland who were teaching their, who were having their kids do online schooling in Ukrainian because Polish schools demand that the children of Ukrainian women, um, Ukrainian kids study in Polish. So, you know, many of those who are in Poland want to go back soon. They don't want to lose one or two years of schooling. And, and these seem to be kind of sort of Polish nationalistic responses. I mean, certainly Turkey, um, you know, spent a year or two, uh, offering schooling for Syrian refugees in Arabic before they eventually moved to, to, to Turkish when it became clear that this was a community that was going to settle. Um, so there are many sort of issues like this that I think are the sort of clash of the country where so many Ukrainians have ended up settling uh, and the political realities, sort of liberal political realities um, of, of that country and the sort of difficulties of responding to that amongst the countries, you know, key countries who are, who are you know, leading members uh, of NATO and at the forefront of the women, peace and security agenda. And, and very lastly, um, I'll just mention that, you know, it seems as though um, the, the feminist community in Russia um, is, is cowed and repressed and, and, you know, very much sort of intimidated uh, because of the implications of speaking out against this war in Russia. But um, I guess, you know, coming from a country, Iran, that's been sanctioned and whose feminist community has been isolated from its feminist counterparts for years and has suffered as a result of that, I would just sort of flag the idea that, um, that visa bans, you know, which are very understandable, the sort of the sort of seeking out of them um, for sort of just holidaying sort of purposes for Russians, um, you know, there is a civil society uh, implication to um, to bans like that, where sort of right-minded Russians who oppose this war from a feminist perspective uh, and, and other perspectives um, may, may sort of see themselves isolated in addition to being um, repressed internally. And that's just something um, to bear in mind. You know, I think sanctions ends up um, making feminist communities um, very um, sort of detached and cut off and, and they sort of cease to grow as a result. And I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's just worth recognizing the sort of after sort of reverberations of sanctions, um, the unintended consequences of them. So that's what comes to mind now. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much. Um, and yeah, you know, I think the irony, um, sitting in the United States, um, I have been speaking, um, I, I'm president of the International Studies Association meeting right now and thinking about our citing policy. Um, and we are dealing with exactly those kinds of issues because of course, in many parts of the United States, um, uh, women also um, may suffer uh, difficulties with reproductive rights and their health um, should a, an emergency situation arrive um, in uh, an unfortunate state. Um, so I think that the 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 irony is we're seeing, um, you know, kind of this tension um, among, um, uh, you know, around liberal ideas, uh, even within states that we assume are are um, are quite liberal. Um, which which actually brings me, I think, um, in in good stead to to Lewis. I think that um, it's uh, you know. Part of the, you know, you're talking about the resistance of sanctions um, uh, among Latin American countries, which you said was one, um, um, you know, point of agreement. Um, how how much does this sort of tie into, you know, different perspectives um, on um, on the West and embrace in the West and sort of Western ideas, I guess, versus Western countries, um, which are two different things. I think that that is an excellent question, Deborah, especially because I think that the Latin American reaction also exemplifies a division between the operational components of the liberal international order, if we wish to call them like that, the multilateral organizations, international law on the one hand, and then liberal values and Western or curtail, as Alex was saying, leadership of this international order. And the Latin American countries in general what they're saying is that they don't want to impose sanctions because they actually prefer to have a multilaterally designed, coordinated uh, response. Um, they argue that they prefer solutions to controversies that would follow international law over what they see as just targeted economic measures imposed without the approval of a multilateral organization. What they argue is that uh, 
a couple of countries can impose sanctions, but that for them is very much like a, a, a kind of unilateral move or cartel move instead of actually following the procedures of the liberal international order. Um, and if we also pay attention not only to economic sanctions, but also to sending military equipment or military aid to Ukraine, what a lot of the Latin American governments are saying is that they do not support the Wendas in a unilateral way because or without multilateral authorization, because this would only escalate the violence even further, and they prefer to have something a little bit more coordinated. Um, which, again, is different when we pay attention to the values or the leadership. I think that there is a consensus among different Latin American groups that they want a more coordinated response through different multilateral organizations. But then that consensus breaks when we pay attention to the kind of values that they are following. Um, and here, uh, I think that one of the main things that I'm worried about and that we haven't touched upon also is about the effects of uh, Russian propaganda in the global south and the kind of tensions and divisions that the propaganda is causing. And in Latin America, we're seeing that, uh, where even when the countries or the governments in the region are not imposing sanctions, they could regulate the different uh, Russian outlets that are spreading some of this uh, fake news or different propaganda in the region to basically say that this is just the West trying to do again what they have been always doing and expanding into regions uh, by basically crashing pluralism in the international order. And uh, they are also exploiting the Latin American deep history of facing the West and facing the US when it comes to changing governments and changing uh, different values. So what they are saying is that, uh, or at least what the Russian uh, propaganda I think is doing is benefiting from this idea that, well, the liberal international order shouldn't be liberal. It should be a pluralist international order where different governments can coexist, where different ways of governing can coexist. So I think that we need to think a little bit deeper in how we even conceptualize the international order to separate between these two different components. And maybe uh, we can convince different Latin American governments to sanction if we do use this more coordinated multilateral venues instead of just asking for unilateral uh, economic sanctions. Um, but then again, I think it's also difficult to disentangle the operational components of the order with the different values and leadership that comes with the liberal international order. Yeah, thank you. I think that's actually super interesting to think about the distinction between a liberal cartel and a pluralist global order. Um, you know, that that that's a very interesting kind of distinction. I, I think among different ideas about democracy, kind of underlying the different ones. Um, and um, and I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's exactly the kind of thing that the Planetary Politics Project is trying to, you know, sort of bring up, bring to the fore. Um, you know, because that that does pose potential um, solutions as well. Alex, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just pick up on something Luis just said. Um, you know, the difference between sort of the infrastructure of the order versus its constitutive norms. Um, I think, you know, one of those norms that doesn't resonate, resonate, unfortunately, from my perspective, is that Ukraine's fighting for its democracy, right? Um, of course, it's fighting for its democracy. And actually, you've seen at the decentralized, at the local level, um, such a response from Ukrainian civil society and you know, local municipalities and, 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 and the territorial forces themselves would not have been organized without that uh, kind of democratic self-governance. The problem is that prior to this war, even for a good many years, over 10 years, democracy as a norm has been on the defensive. Uh, more and more countries have been sliding. Um, uh, it doesn't mean the same thing that it meant in the 1990s. And actually because of also what happened in the post-Soviet space um, in, uh, the 2000s, it's become synonymous with uh, Western imposed um, coercion and regime change, color revolutions, Arab Spring, right? So in some ways saying that this is about democracy feeds into some of these Russian lines about uh, world order. Uh, I would say, you know, talking about Ukrainian sovereignty is potentially a more effective message um, to have in terms of reaching the global South. Um, and then just the second point, what, what really strikes me in um, the memes and 
a lot of the theories coming out about Russia um, on the IR side, I'm not talking about the first channel that's filled with actually genocidal talk and you know the eradication of the Ukrainian um, um, agency. But in terms of some of the strategic think tanks and IR commentators, this isn't about Ukraine, which is just stunning to me. Ukraine is rarely mentioned. This is about global order contradictions, the West, NATO. It's about like everything else, right, except Ukraine. And what strikes me is the assumption here that Russia has that any kind of non-Western world or post-Western world is a world that it's going to be a really important player in. And I think that might be challenged or at least sort of empirically assessed um, to come. And, and, and there's no reason actually to assume that. In some ways, Russia has the kind of contrarian stature it has because it is the revisionist power, right, that seeks to put a spotlight on Western contradictions. But it's not at all clear to me, um, given the, its hollowing out of its um, capabilities that we're seeing now, it's going to be in any position to dictate a post-Western sort of plural world and its architecture. Great, thank you. So we are um, we are rapidly approaching end of time. Um, and so um, I'm gonna just um, uh, give everyone like 30 seconds to wrap up kind of a, a quick last or actually a minute, but I'll say 30 seconds because we all go over. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll talk, um, we'll, we'll start again with Volodymyr. Sure. Yeah, I would like to pick up where uh, Alex ended. Uh, actually, we had discussions with Alex over the years, uh, whom I know for over years, uh, about uh, democracy promotion and liberalism and uh, value-based policy. And I was always a big fan of uh, American foreign policy becoming values-based. And he was he would often say, when I hear values-based policy, I imagine American airplanes with their missiles under their wings uh, coming to places like Iraq. So we have a discussion. But my view was always that I'd like a democratic order, liberal democratic order to be with cheese to be capable of defending itself and promoting itself actively enough. And that's uh, why we would want to be part of it. We don't want to be part of something which is like, you know, shapeless uh, and uh, without any instinct to fight for itself and defend itself. No, we want a different type of liberal order. Uh, it wouldn't survive by itself. You need to nurture it. And, and that's a great thing that you have an administration now in America, which is doing that or trying to do that. And actually American leadership is back. I mean, I, haven't, I couldn't remember the times when the American leadership was so needed like it is right now. And we really appreciate it here in, in, in Ukraine. And also we're not gonna give up on democracy. Right now, of course, because of war, war powers, you know, limitations on our human rights, civil rights like myself, I couldn't go abroad, for instance. Uh, it's not very prone and conducive for democracy here in this country because of the war. But in the longer term, in the longer term, Ukrainians are not giving up on democracy. Thank you. Great, thank you. Asada, last words. Um, I'll just pick up on this really, oops. Oh, you can hear me. Um, I'll just pick up on this really interesting um, point about the infrastructure or the gap between the architecture of the liberal international order um, and the uh, the use of its um, the use of that architecture for the advocate advocation advocacy of its normative values. Um, the women, peace, and security. Um, agenda has an infrastructure. NATO has a women, peace and security uh, sort of institution within its command. Um, Nordic states who are in NATO have uh, ministers or uh, envoys to WPS. Uh, the, the US State Department has someone sitting um, in the, global, the, the Office of Global Women's Affairs, which is connected to the White House. I mean, there are institutions across all of these countries that kind of compose the liberal international order that could take up women, peace and security issues uh, in this war and that they could you know, sort of use those institutions to pursue uh, and defend the liberal values um, and the, the dangers that women are facing that are coming up. And, and that's simply not happening. Um, and I think it opens up so much room for the Russian disinformation and the sort of uh, very sort of transactional sort of use of that disinformation to sort of point out that these uh, 
uh, that these policies are Western hypocrisies, that they're empty and that they're used to uh, oppress the global South when the oppressors of women are jihadist groups, for example, which is something you hear everywhere. So, you know, why not take up that opportunity? Um, there are issues in Poland, there are issues around sanctions, there are issues around uh, forced conscription in, in Ukraine, which carries a lot of dangers uh, for men and women, both in Ukraine doesn't need it at this point. You know, Ukraine has um, uh, a very vital society that's coming forward to defend it. And, and wouldn't that project so much strength if it could do that without imposing forced conscription? So yeah, simply to end, I mean, we have an agenda, we have institutions that are meant to back it. Um, and, and why are uh, the states that lead that liberal order not um, availing themselves of, of what they created at a time when it's urgent? Thank you. Luis. I think that I'm also going to um, echo some of the points that we have been talking about the, the international order, especially because I think that uh, the division that we see in how Latin America, in particular with the global south in general, is reacting might be because there is a messaging failure from uh, Ukraine's allies. I think that we, as, as Alex was saying, we portray this as a you are in favor of the liberal international order or you are against instead of like you are in favor of supporting a, a small country that is being invaded, that is uh, facing interference by a major power, which I think would resonate much more in the global south because, well, a, a lot of countries in the global south have faced that interference in the past. Um, and I think that Trinidad Tobago, for example, was very successful at convincing Latin American states of uh, stripping Russia from its observer status at the Organization of American States, exactly using this kind of messaging by basically saying Russia is attacking a, a smaller neighbor, it's interfering in the smaller neighbor. We know how that is, let's actually support Ukraine. So I think that we need to rethink how we message uh, this in order to gain more support from the Global South. Thank you. Alex, last words. I've said all there is to say on this topic, and I've learned a tremendous amount from the panelists. So thank you again for bringing us together. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to the audience. Um, we can't see you, but um, we hope you enjoyed it. And we look forward to, to further interactions. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.